Are you a sex worker looking to build a new website or a website redesign? Then you'll want to consider Fox Digital. They did a fantastic job designing my website, Stripped by Sia. If you want your website done, mention that you're a listener of the show at foxdigital.design for 20% off. Tell them I sent you. Welcome back to another episode of Stripped by Sia, your podcast for strippers, sex workers, and all the fancy naked people in between. I am your host, Steph Sia, aka Kimchi on stage. I am taking a break. Um, It's the holidays at this point when this episode is released, or at least going into the holidays, and I have a lot of family coming in, a lot of commitments in that front, so you probably won't be seeing me on stage until January. I am sorry, but I am available because I'm also a digital content creator. On my OnlyFans, if you feel super inclined, you can do that. I was also a a sugar baby for a number of years as well. I talk about that in some earlier episodes if you're curious about that, but a lot of you listening out there are actually listening because you're curious about sex work. Maybe you've never tried it before. Maybe you, it's maybe you're a veteran in the industry. Uh, maybe you're a client listening. There's a lot of you that are all coming from different walks of life and different reasons um, for listening to the show. But the show is all about sex work. It's all about destigmatizing our industry because obviously, as you may or may not know, we are in a highly stigmatized <laughs> job, um, profession slash industry, um, often misunderstood. So I bring on different guests every single week to speak a little bit about their own experiences in the adult industry, um, whether or not they are talent or the behind the scenes or whatnot. Um, I just do the show to kind of humanize sex workers, um, bring a different and transparent approach to the work that we do. And yeah, I've been doing that every single week for the past three years because of all you listeners out there who are interested in this content. Um, so thank you. Um, another big thank you going out to some Patreon subscribers out there as well. So just going to be shouting out uh, those in the second and top tier. Um, thank you so much for financially helping support the show. Uh, my new website is out now. It's strippedbysia.com. Give it a peep. Um, but hello to Snoo Snoo from Germany. We've got Ted McGuire, who's brand new. Selena Money, who's also brand new. Arub Sarkar and Jay Sunsern, who are local here to Vancouver, Canada. And Justin Erickson from Washington, um, in Van- Vancouver, Washington, the other Vancouver in the United States. Thank you again for subscribing. Really appreciate the support. The website is now up, which is where basically your money is going to and that's pretty much it for that and last but last last but not least I'm sorry it's the first thing in the morning and I'm recording this shout out to Skyhawk After Dark TV um it is an adult industry network that hosts a lot of adult podcasts like this also adult video casts Uh, A lot of people doing similar things to what I'm doing, but different. Same, same, but different. So be sure to check them out. It's skyhawkafterdarktv.com. Okay, we've got that under four minutes. Thank God. I'm getting better at that. (laughs) Woo! Great. I can tell you're a pro. There's a lot of talking. And like when I'm doing this first thing in the morning, I'm like, my voice isn't warmed up. I haven't talked to a human yet. It's just like, oh my God, let's let's do this. But okay, I'm here. <laughs> but what everyone else is listening and what everyone else listening today is more interested in is this week's guest, which I'm really excited to bring on. And um, I'm super stoked. It is the one and only Spencer Bradley, who is joining me today. And if you are not familiar with Spencer, uh, they are a former exotic dancer, a content creator as well, you know, fitness and pole instructor, and now AVN and XBiz nominated porn star and featured dancer. Hello. Did I miss anything? I just... <laughs> <laughs> I think you got it all professionally. Thank you so much, Sia. I really appreciate you having me on and like, 
given me an opportunity to like speak openly. Like I love the uh, concept of your podcast. So I'm excited to get started. Thank you. And we're very excited to have you. And I know we were chatting off the air earlier, but just talking about your amazing fans and all the awesome questions that have come in. I am super stoked. They're super invested in you. They're committed. And yeah, I'm just, I'm looking forward to getting to know you and also introducing the audience to you today as well. So let's throw back to you. I know I named a bunch of things and titles and whatnot, but who is Spencer Bradley in your own words and terms? In my own words and terms, um, Spencer Bradley, as my Twitter bio would put it, enthusiastic slut. (laughs) <laughs> which was sort of a play on enthusiastic consent because when I first got into business, like the first roles I was getting were all like step family roles, which normally always like involves a little bit of coercion, not always, or it's like, I don't know. There's just, there was a lot of like course of script writing and um, I just wanted to you wanted you to know that when I'm on set, that's not going to be happening. I'm going to be changing the script. I'm going to be, you know what I mean? I love that. Like, so yeah, um, I see myself as somebody who's just very passionate. I'm not going to say that's always a good thing. It's my uh, it's a weakness and a strongness. But yeah, Spencer Radley is just. Somebody is is just a human living their life like everyone else. And um, I found sex work as um, my um, way of getting the green stuff that helps me do things. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Awesome. And I love that. And there were so many points like within that short statement there that I would love to ask you about too. And, and we can get into that later to, uh, too, in terms of like the course of scripts and whatnot, when we get into more of the chat about your career. Um, but tell us about this passion because was it, was this something that led you to sex work or were you always like a passionate person in general or like, tell us about that. Let's start there. I feel like I've always been a passionate person in general. I was the kid that, like, when I got excited about something, they'd be like, oh, my God, calm down. Like, it was wrong to, like, be excited about something or something. Um, And I'm sorry, did you say how did I get into sex work? Yeah, like, did that – did the passion lead you into sex work or is the passion oh. started or, like, just, like, what? Where where does it come from? Okay, no, I was born with that passion stuff. It's It, it can be annoying sometimes. But <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I started stripping because I was in college. Um, was it, it was either the second semester of – no, no, no. It was the first semester of my sophomore year that I started stripping – I was also working at Sephora. I was also working for a mobile bridal company. I also had my own salon chair at a chair in South Bend. And I was living out of my car taking two online classes at Ball State because I had decided um, to take a semester off sort of, but not off, like still do some like basic classes in case I wanted to go back because mm-hmm. I was I don't want to say I was forced into college. I still chose, but I chose for my parents' happiness. Like, yes, we've like, all been yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, you know that. my dad was like, we had one child, so we could afford for them to go to college, and you're not going to go to college. I saved my entire life for you to go to college, and you're not going to go to college. Oh. I've been whispering college uh, in your ears since you were in your mother's womb, and you're not, you're not going to go to college. Uh, so I part like like I I was working a bunch of jobs like I already told you I Sephora I had my own chair and I was working for a mobile bridal company and I was still in my freaking car couch hopping like Mm -hmm. I I realized shit was hard so I was like dad I'd love to go back to school um but before I did that I started stripping like right before the semester started because in my head, I was like, oh, I'll just get the money and go move to New York where I really want to be. And me and my cat, Lucifer, will be happy in New York City. 
<laughs> and then I learned stripper money really doesn't work like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, go off. Go into that statement. <laughs> <laughs> Please share. <laughs> Elaborate. Please share. I mean, I'm sure you've spoken about it with other guests on uh, the show, but for anyone new um, on Sia's podcast right now that hasn't gotten to listen to any of her conversations, I'm going to assume this is a conversation you've had. Um, strippers pay to go to work, guys. Just so you know, it's a gamble. When we walk in, we don't know which wallets are going to open up, whose wallets are even walking in, if those wallets will even open up. Like, you guys just assume, like, it's crazy to me that some people think we get paid hourly. Like, that's hilarious (laughs) to me. That, that, yeah, mm -hmm, that made me laugh too. Yeah, I know. We've definitely had and shared many of these conversations, especially in season one where it was very, like, stripper-focused and then I branched out. But, yes, like (laughs) – and you just don't know. It, it's very – I mean, it's unstable is a word that we can choose to use for that. I mean, it's it's up and down because as you mentioned. Salmon. Yeah. Yes. It's I've great. described as stripping, like still stripping to this day, still even after doing like mainstream porn, stripping has the highest highs and the lowest lows. Correct. Correct. I have to agree. Like there's a lot of potential. Yes. Lots of potential. But then sometimes you are going to have those dead days and people just not tipping or, you know, you're not going to be getting those whales. And I feel like, especially with like strip talk and just a lot of social media kind of hyping stripping. (laughs) Yeah. You're (laughs) for those watching the video, Spencer's like rolling her eyes and just like nodding and (laughs) in agreement. Because I feel like it's a lot um, – a lot of the work is glamorized. It's glamorized. It's not showing, like, what people are actually doing, what type of club they're at. Like, it, it depends what type of money you're making at what club, how you're making it. Maybe you're only showing your good nights. And I hear from my stripper friends that it's getting oversaturated with girls who think it's, like, easy. And, like, <laughs> yes. yes, you won't know the game coming in, but, like, they're being arrogant because of TikTok and, like, thinking they already know the game so now there's all these girls in there like screwing it up and like now customers aren't coming in as much because they don't know you go up and you approach everyone because you don't know what's in whose wallet Absolutely. you know what i mean obviously like scope out shoes and watch but that doesn't always tell you shit oh you know what no. i know <laughs> they're approaching customers while they're already like sitting with dancers i'm hearing i'm hearing that they're taking customers off stage like i'm just hearing like a bunch of like i heard there are some not all the baby strippers are like that like there are like a lot like, like willing to learn or whatever but i'm also hearing there's a lot that are just like why aren't i making money blah 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 and it's like You got to work. (laughs) Yeah. Have you approached every single person in the room? Yes. Okay. Wait 15 minutes. Has anyone new come in? No. Okay. Go do another round anyway. Exactly. Make up something creative. I literally got magic tricks at one point because I was tired of approaching groups. I love that. (laughs) And the people who were like, I don't spend money on girls. It's like, okay, want to make a bet that I get your card right? (laughs) I love that. So, I mean, yeah, stripping, we we have our opinions. I mean, as I'm still a dancer and (laughs) it it can be frustrating. And like, I don't know, maybe I should do an episode in terms of like stripping in this economy is like another thing too. And it's compared to like the girls that I know that have stripped, way longer than I have they're like the money just is not the same anymore it's just not I hear you I think you definitely should do an episode like that I think you should do it with some veterans that have went through the first the 2008 recession Mm -hmm. those are the ones I'm hearing from on Twitter that are like no guys I don't think you understand how bad bad this is like 2008 wasn't even like this I don't think you understand this is like (laughs) level shit right now so but yes Perhaps stay tuned. I'll have to develop maybe something in the new year about that episode. But today we're we're focusing on you. Um, So we we were just talking about scratching the surface in terms of like how you got into sex work. So basically um, going back to, okay, you started stripping. It was the first semester of your sophomore year. 
Where yes. did that go? Did you like stripping? How was that? Like, and <laughs> how was I that? loved stripping. The first time I walked into a strip club, you know when you just have that feeling of belonging. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like I walked around and the girls were on stage. I was just looking up at them smiling. And <laughs> I remember talking to this one. I went up to her. She was on a smaller stage. I said, You're so pretty. She goes, My name's Electra. Are you gonna work here? I said, Yeah, I'm gonna audition. I'm gonna try. She goes, You're so cute. And it's so <laughs> cute looking back on that because that was my home club for like three years. Amazing. And I auditioned that night with a blue mohawk. Um oh my god. <laughs> Oh, that's and so cool. it was so funny because it was one of those clubs. So it's in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Mm. Super red, right? Like yeah. picking, people are picking up on what I'm saying when I say that, right? Yes, it's yes. super red. And normally, the rules in that club where you are not allowed to have any color of hair besides blonde, brunette, or like natural redhead, right? And when I got hired, there were girls. I, it wasn't mean forever but when I first got in there were some like sour girls there that were like you're gonna have to change your hair color you know you're not allowed to have blue hair right Mm -hmm. and I would just say to them I was like well I got hired like this so what are you gonna do about it (laughs) yeah yeah what are you what are you gonna do about it literally what like (laughs) come 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 get me (laughs) how was your experience dancing like how did it all go for you? Um, I honestly loved dancing. Um, and I think as a baby stripper and as you're going up your learning curve, it's like, this is amazing. This is amazing. This is amazing. And then you hit your very first burnout. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then you try to keep going and you keep hitting. Well, some people don't keep going, but a burnout is always going to happen eventually, whether you go back or not, whatever. And uh, if you go back, burnouts are going to continue to happen. But I loved it because it was pretty flexible for for the most part. When I first started dancing, I was super naive. They were like, well, we need you here at least four nights a week. I was like, well, I take classes an hour away. They were like, okay, well, you can do three nights a week. And it was over an hour away from my university. So I was going back and forth doing that full-time school, full-time stripping, three to four nights a week with over an hour drive one way. Um... But so, but after I got like in a little bit there, cause you know how strip club politics work, you know, like they weren't, they weren't making me like come in as much and especially after they see like what money you can pull in and whatever, mm. you know, yeah, and just how you behave at the club. Like I was one of those strippers, like y- you already know, I hated college literally when my shift was done and we closed at three in the morning, three in the morning, five in the morning. <laughs> three, three, three on weekdays five on the weekends wow that's late something like that yeah um i was the stripper who like the bar people were closing down and i w- i was helping close down the bar because i wanted to like count my money and smoke cigarettes and help and just talk shit with everyone because i was not ready for that hour drive to go home yeah to my lonely apartment on a college full of like people i don't relate to like my last semester, at least class-wise, um, was a little cooler, but I also, that's when, yeah, never mind. But we're going off on something else. Anyway, <laughs> so I was stripping, stripping, graduated college. Um, as soon as I graduated college, uh, actually, this part is important. I'll skip that. <laughs> at, at one point um, during, this is probably about, this wasn't even a year after I graduated college. I got pulled over and I was charged with possession. Oh. Okay. And um, that led me – and I had already, like, given up my place where I was stripping. Um, well, not when I had gotten pulled over because the court dates and everything were just so drawn out. Like, between the court dates and my probation and everything, everything took, like, if not two years, I bet over. Oh, wow. Like, I know, like, at least around the two-year mark. Like, it was absolutely fucking ridiculous. So, um, during all the court things and everything, like, I finish up my lease in Indianapolis, like, stripping there. And I had already been ready 
to get out mm-hmm. of the state, if not the country. Like yeah. right before my probation, I had went and lived in Brazil for a month just to go fucking experience it. Like mm-hmm. I was ready. And my pro- or my lawyer kept saying, you're not going to get probation. You're not going to get probation. So during all this court stuff in between my apartment lease being up and waiting to finish up all the court stuff, I was staying with my parents. Mm-hmm. And they're like hours away from any decent strip club, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's when I started like online sex work was when I was on probation and I found out because I just stayed at my parents after I found out I got hit with probation that I was told that I wasn't going to get after I was doing all these research on all these different places, like getting so ready to like wrap this case up and finally like get the hell out. And then they're like, no, you got to stay in Indiana for a year. Fuck. So I get hit um, with probation and I start online work and I start camming and I start doing clips. I'm like, Oh my God, this is fucking hard. Like, if you don't have a platform, like, you really got it. So, um, a few months in, I get this offer from someone in Florida. Um, and I'm thankful I got my foot into porn because of them. But, um, they did not give me... I I was another little cog for them to make like a few extra bucks with. Gotcha. Never considered a launching pad for me or like a career path or anything. And it's like you recruited me, like like, and I was just trying to rub two dimes together. And it's not like I'm dumb. I just hadn't done any research into porn. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'd already been camming at that point. And I like obviously looked up the agency online. I was like, at this point, it's like somebody else holding the camera. Mm -hmm. Whatever. Yeah, but um, I didn't know about like creating like a launching pad and a pathway for yourself, like marketing wise. Right. Um. Yeah, and like really maximizing your image, and then therefore like your reach, blah blah, blah all that. Um. They just like threw me right in as like just like warm body. Like you need a body today. Here, here here's one. You know. Gotcha. Um. So once I learned the potential, because I I came into porn trying to rub two dimes together. I'm not going to lie. Like, I did not give a shit. And then I was like, oh, I kind of have to, like, give a shit. Yeah. Like, this this has potential. I can be something. And in a way, like, porn kind of, like, I'm not going to say got me out of my depression, but it got me moving during my depression, at least doing something. Mm Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. Okay. There's, there's a lot here. There's a lot here. Okay. Where should we, where should we start? <laughs> like, well, And yeah, during my probation, um, I traveled basically the whole time because, um, work was in Florida. So I'd, I'd be in Florida. Um, that's when I first start, before I was even shot my first scene because of MFC, I found out about Exotica's. I was in Chicago. Mm-hmm. I was shooting content with people in Milwaukee. Like my probation officer is just letting me go everywhere. So that's that was- amazing. You were lucky. <laughs> yeah, no, privilege for sure. <laughs> it almost going to be like that. But I mean, good for you for, for starting something up in, you know, and, and innovating during that time. Um, when you first got recruited, of course, yeah, you did a little bit of research, but not a whole ton. You know, like you did research on the company, but not so much about like, okay, how is this going to like affect my career? Or how am I even going to make a career out of this? Tell us about like the recruitment um, phase. Like, was it like a message on Instagram or somewhere that the like I've always hear I've always heard about like, oh, someone messaged me or DM'd me and invited me out to usually Florida or Vegas and whatnot. So. Tell us a little bit about that because it's been a while since we had a story like this <laughs> on the show. Um, so I was DM'd on Twitter from a Florida recruiter. And um, that's just basically how it started. I don't know how she found me. Um, yeah, it was just a Twitter DM. And I am thankful for it because it got my foot in the door because I was not looking to get into porn. If I was looking to get into porn, I would not have went with them and did the things that I did. Um, if you are look, if you're listening to this and you're looking into going into porn, um, people, 
if someone is recruiting and you're not I don't know it's just it's a weird thing anymore Mm -hmm. because I feel like in American culture at least like porn has been pretty popularized like people wear playboy stuff just to wear playboy stuff Mm -hmm. you know what I mean yeah um, where was I going on about that though? Sorry, I haven't eaten yet today, so I might no, do this okay. a lot with my head. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, you were um, gonna say something along the lines of like, oh yeah, like a like a if war you're interested in porn. Yeah, yeah. Do your research. It's gonna be intimidating, and pe- a lot of people probably won't message back because we're busy people. I'll just put it frankly. But if a girl's DMs are open. Or, like, you follow her and she happens to follow you back and the DMs open. Message as many people as you can. Um, ask them about their experiences. Um, and just what a good place to start is. Who good people are to talk to um, as far as their experience with, like, agencies and such. Because, like, I don't know how much you know about the porn world. But, like, Spiegler, for example... He is the most legendary porn agent ever. Yeah. There's li- there's a literal documentary about him. There's um that movie Pleasure that just came out. That's like, oh, they don't boy. say it, but like. That's about him. It's basically like about Spiegler girls so far mm-hmm. as what I'm understanding. What I'm mm-hmm. like hearing. Um, but yeah, people people like that he's he's not gonna recruit he doesn't need to recruit he gets hundreds of emails a day yes you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like so i would just say if someone is recruiting you be careful if you did your research and people aren't accepting you because when i finally did a little bit of research after i did my first scenes and i went to go to another agency they didn't accept me and they told me for a reason that wasn't the real reason. And I heard things um, behind my back that was like, I have yellow teeth, I look pregnant, blah, 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 all that. So I'd also say like, don't get discouraged, like take what you can take, but also know your shit. Like I've been on set before and um, some dude, it was just a regular POV shoot and some dude, and it was just me and some dude. And this is when I wasn't, like, yeah, with a great agency. But anyways, um, he was like, we always do anal for our shoots. He, the, yeah, our owner wants every girl to do anal. And it's like, anal is one of those things where, like, if you wait long enough, like, you could get a, get a big payday off that. Yeah. You're going to have it on a big company where you're going to grow your fan base really wide. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and I was 24 years old, 25 years old at the time. It's not like I was some young, dumb chicken or mm-hmm. anything. But at the same time, I didn't know porn politics. I didn't know about, like, premiums and stuff like that. I didn't I end up it. doing it but because I knew a little bit about it in my head. But, like, yeah. So, like, if you're – say your best option for – and you do want an agent to getting into porn and you don't want to self-book and you're with an agent that maybe you're not – just know your worth stick up for yourself don't don't feel like you because i felt like i had to go with anything just to like right. respect and porn and it, it works the opposite way oh that's an interesting perspective yeah tell us tell us a bit more about that like how do you think it went like it didn't benefit you essentially like like i think a lot of like so Porn works a lot like, you know, the Madonna horror complex, right? Yes. And like, yeah, the whole virginity thing and everything. Porn almost works like that. Like when you Mm -hmm. are a new girl, like just because they've never met you before and stuff, that's almost like a virgin. Right. So like your first scene is a big deal. Like your first things are a big deal. It's supposed to go, oh, you do some implied nudes. Oh, you get a market. Oh, Oh, you showed something. Oh, oh, you played with yourself. Oh, you did a solo. Oh, oh my God. Now you're with another girl. Oh my God. She filmed a dick in her. Holy shit. Like, okay. So you only get 
one chance really at that beginning to establish like Yourself. your value basically. Mm -hmm. And I established my value as um, a warm body you can get quick for only three figures. Mm. Um, wow. So wow. yeah, all I would say is um, all I would say is don't be afraid to stand up for your worth. Know your worth. Know how this shit works. Talk yeah. more with the performers mm -hmm. than with anyone else. Talk more with the performers. Oh wow. Okay, this is so profound. Like we haven't really talked about this much on the show too, just because like well yeah we talked about like people getting scammed or you know taken advantage of which unfortunately does happen in our industry but can it happen in lots of other industries as well but in terms of like this this kind of perspective that it's almost like a gradual thing or at least that's yeah, how it, or, like, it doesn't yeah. have to go that way but that's mm -hmm. like the stereotypical typical. yeah like pathway there that's interesting and I feel like and I've mentioned this in, in different capacities on the show too but like when you say know your worth, like know like your boundaries too and what you are consenting to do because again, like there are agencies that can take advantage of you. They don't have your best interests at heart and what, yeah, yeah. Like it's, it's a lot of that. So it's really important for people to do this prior research, to listen to shows like this, to, to yeah. like, ask for referrals and whatnot uh, to protect yourself. 100% like when I got into porn I was so foolish after five years of porn uh, or five years after five years of stripping I thought porn was gonna be like an office I show up there's all these people here there's a makeup artist there's coffee <laughs> I get a check after I'm done working you know what I mean yeah I, yeah I thought I didn't have anything to worry about <laughs> I was so wrong. <laughs> if you are a stripper thinking about going into mainstream porn, talk to these performers, man, because this shit is not an office. Yeah. I mean, tell us about like, tell us about that too. Like, you know, a, a, a typical like day in the life um, in terms of even like prep work and stuff like that. Like things that, you know, people listening might not have that perspective or have the understanding. I'd love to hear a little, let's a little glimpse of, uh, on that. Um, it depends on the day. So let me think about my last shoot. Um, so my last shoot um, went sort of late. Um, we were already the second scene of the day. It was supposed to be a girl, girl, girl scene. Um, There's a, not a whole lot of dialogue, but like, you know, enough to take up a few hours of time, you know. And then we get to the point where we're going to, like, initiate the sex and everything. And there's an issue that comes up that's out of anybody's control. And we have to rework the script. And we just did it in a flash like that. Like, ad lived an argument and, like, the other girls stormed off. And then it was just a girl-girl scene. And um, so, yeah, a typical day is, like, arriving um most days at least for me thankfully like I love you get your makeup done you know you're just talking with the people and when you've been in long enough you know the crew members by name you're saying hi you're giving hugs you're talking with people uh when the other talent is in the chair maybe you pull up your test for them and you show like your test like hey I'm within the two weeks there you go you fill out paperwork together, you bullshit together a little bit. Um, so, yeah, um, at, at one point, a lot of the time you talk about consent, you talk about not just your no's. I love asking people for their yeses. What mm -hmm. do you like? Right. <laughs> Give me yeah. what you like, too, not just like what not to do. Totally. Um, so there's that consent talk. And sometimes there is, sometimes there's, not with this last shoot there wasn't any sex stills mm -hmm. um they're just gonna screen grab that's normal for that company right but normally it goes like hair and makeup um photos for pretty girls um dialogue sex stills sex 
and you're done, which doesn't sound like a lot, but like picture like a whole crew of people moving around lights up and stairs and mansions and cameras and redoing sets and, you know, talent going over lines and like retouching makeup and douches and brushing teeth and lunch breaks because God forbid some of these days are long. Right. And like, I mean, tell us about like, it's the, is it like a full day shoot? Can it be hours? Or like, t- tell us about that. Um, I have definitely been on multiple sets. And I will say, they're all the same person except one. Well, actually, I can't even say that because I, I was in makeup, but they did shoot <laughs> it as quick as him. Mike Quasar is notorious in the industry for being able to shoot a scene in an hour and a half, two hours. Wow. Um, So I've never spent more than two hours on uh, that director's set. There was one set recently where um, the hair and makeup and setting up and everything took whatever amount of time. But as soon as we were ready to go, like we literally shot it like in the same amount of time that like Quasar is notorious for wow. like dialogue, sex and everything. We got it done in less than two hours for wow. sure. But then there's days where like, I don't know, there's just like a lot of dialogue or there's prop because it's sex. We're working with our bodies, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, Physical. there's lots of different, yeah, there's different <laughs> things that can happen to different body parts and they're not in anybody's control all the time. Right. Um, so that can elongate a day. Um, yeah, just different sets, dialogue, bodies. That's that's basically what takes so long. Absolutely. And like I know you kind of were talking earlier about burnout when you were stripping. Is a burnout different when it comes to porn? And like Yeah. Yeah. Tell tell us about both, like comparing the two if, if you want. So the burnout, okay. Hmm. I'll start in my mind with like a Venn diagram of what's like similar. Sure. Um, I definitely want like intimate touch from somebody I trust, mm-hmm. or at least to find someone I trust to just like be like hugged and held and like, you know, have my head rubbed and whatever. Um, I'm sorry. We we're okay. We were talking about burnout. Um, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Um. Just being tired, not wanting to get up, especially stripping, being so physical. Uh, Porn can be pretty physical, too. Um, Mentally, it sucks. Um, With with stripping, it was more like the emotional and the like not like the emotional labor paired with not knowing what you're even going to walk out with that night. That would burn me out. It's a lot of anxiety sometimes. Yeah, exactly. And it's not emotional labor that burns me out as much because I do like a lot of my co-stars and everything. I want like some real sex. I want someone to like cuddle me from behind and like, like, I don't know, like even partner, like I had, it wasn't a partner. We were just like screwing off camera, but it was like making love like that. But like, even still, like, I just want to like, I don't know. Like, I literally just want to be two blobs of skin, like, like, (laughs) you know, like that fucking lost. You know what I mean? Because it is performance art, what I do. It's like a sport, but like, there's not a winner or a loser. Right. Um, So my burnout is, um, and I can't, at least at the point where I'm at in my career, um, I'm very thankful to be with the agency that I'm with. And part of the reason I'm even on that roster is my reliability. Good. And if I've booked a shoot, then I'm showing up to that shoot unless I'm sick and I'm going to spread something or I'm literally dying yeah. or like something, something, something happened, something like that, that literally, you know what I mean? Out of like your control. Like, yeah. 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 Um, but with stripping, you could say, fuck it. I'm not going in tonight. Right. And then if you wake up and you're having an unexpected, really bad, depressed day, you have to show up to set and smile. And that can be so fucking hard sometimes when you show up to set. This does not happen. Most, like I said, most days are great. Most of the talents I work with are great. 
I've literally had a person say, she was like, do you even want to be here? I was like, sure. She goes, I don't want to be here. I was like, I love hearing that from someone I'm about to have sex with. And then, you know, she said she's going to leave or whatever. But then I wasn't like catty the rest of the day. I was just like, just at that moment I was. Because it's like, why would you say that to someone you're about to have Like, really? Yeah. Like, like we literally both have to be here. You don't know how I'm feeling. Like, why would you even set that tone? Yeah. So I'd say the burnout is different because I can't literally disappear. I, I can't disappear anymore. And I think that part drives me crazy. Well, in situations like that, because we're all human and, you know, we're allowed, it's valid to feel like that. And we all have shitty days. But, like, of course, like, we don't always have the privilege of saying no to work, right? So I'm curious about how you deal with burnout and how do you cope? Because, like, this happens to so many sex workers. It doesn't matter if you're in porn or if you're stripping or other parts, too. There's like, Even OnlyFans is so freaking tiring or any kind of online work is really tiring. But how does Spencer Bradley, how do you deal with burnout and not go crazy? Um, journaling helps a lot. And sometimes I need a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Sorry. Like I said, I haven't eaten breakfast. That's sometimes okay. I need a catalyst for that journaling. Mm-hmm. So I'll use like tarot and oracle decks. I'll be like, what blessings am I not seeing? Um, how am I self-sabotaging? Um, and whatever the cards say, I'll write something based off that that was based off my question. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or just journaling in general. Um, I also, I, you know what? I don't care if my PR person yells at me for this. I love microdosing. I haven't microdosed in months after this podcast. I'll probably pop a little microdose um, of nice. mushrooms, yeah. psilocybin mushrooms. Um, my previous experience with mushrooms before was always like tripping like tripping you Mm -hmm. know what I mean and then I didn't get into microdosing until porn and man that that helps a lot like oh yeah super relaxing I mean that's my own experience with microdosing too because it's just like it's really hard for myself to just like say no to work and just to chill the fuck out. It's really hard for me to relax and like relax. That word doesn't really exist in my vocabulary. So I, I need help with, um, yeah, either microdosing with psilocybin or like edibles. Um, and that helps me a lot um, personally, but I'd love to hear like your own journey with that too. Cause like, I don't, I personally don't think it's a bad thing. Oh, yeah. No, sometimes I literally like this is what happens with me is I get on a good little streak where I'm not doing it every day. It's like every like every other day Mm -hmm. or like every three days or something. Right. And then I'm like, I'm doing so good. And the funniest shit about this is this is exactly what I would do with my fucking SSRIs when I was like taking like doctor medicine. Mm -hmm. Um, I was like, I'm doing so much better now. And then I'd forget about them. (laughs) <laughs> now my mental health is like in the gutter and I'm like oh yeah I have my medicine like <laughs> I forgot to take my medicine shit <laughs> so that that's when I know it's time to um yeah recalibrate is when I think to myself like ah oh, fuck like shit's rough like waking up every day and then when I have that thought When's the last time you microdosed? <laughs> like, wait a minute, it's been like a month. <laughs> yeah, because like, um, I don't know how accurately I'm about to describe this, but um, your default mode regions and your hippocampus, I think that's what it is, are basically separated when you're on psilocybin. Mm. So you can only be here. It's hard to think about the past or the um future Future, yeah when the default mode regions and the hippocampus are separated Mm -hmm. that's why like i don't know like vision and stuff can change a little bit and but we won't even get into like the real hardcore visuals but some people report (laughs) you know microdosing like whoa i'm seeing a little bit crisper like a little bit clearer like you know i don't know like 
I sorry, I got off on another tangent. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, not at all. No, not at all. We can loop this back because we haven't even talked about like chemical dependency and sex work too. Um, this is probably a good transition for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 100% yeah. Because uh, microdosing has helped with that as well. Because uh, you're able to laugh at yourself for shit, dude. Like, because it, it doesn't make shit disappear. Microdosing just helps you put things in different perspectives so you can help yourself. And I even have this TikTok where I'm laughing in my car because it was a microdose day. And I'd just gotten back from the post office and I was laughing to myself and I recorded this thought. And this was something I was told by a friend, like, you really shouldn't put this up, but I'm keeping shit raw, like whatever. Yeah. I was like, um, cause I had another little microdose TikTok. I was like, Hey, I'm today's another microdose day, except I'm not depressed. It's not a depressing day. I'm not depressed. And I started laughing. I was like, actually today is going so good that I thought to myself, you know what would go so well with such an amazing day? Some speed. And then I laughed at myself some more. And I was like, of course I'm not going to. Like, I just, I thought it was a hilarious fucking thought, you know? Like, <laughs> the microdosing the mushrooms made me realize how fucking silly that is. Like, I'm already happy. Like, it's already a great day. What do you mean it's such a great day? That I need to, like fry my serotonin it's doing a good job what it's doing right now <laughs> like <laughs> well like yeah i mean let's let's and i need to follow you on tiktok because that sounds hilarious and you're posting more content <laughs> like that i don't even follow you but tell us about like the relationship between chemical dependency and sex work like if if you even think there is a relationship between the two I think they are separate, but I think sex work attracts a lot of um, people who have already had issues. I think people that get issues while they are there are just like trying to cope like everyone else. We have a shit healthcare system. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's that like drugs go with the lifestyle. Like if I didn't start while I was stripping. So I can't speak from that perspective. I can only speculate, but I would speculate from my own drug use and how it escalated. Um, if you started stripping and that's where your drug use started, I assume whether your thing was uppers or downers, like either someone offered or you saw someone or like you just got so, cause I know someone, one of my very close friends, she, she was notorious for being the water drinker for like nearly a year. And then like a year in, drinks really yeah so um i mean she still has a handle of herself but like there was there was at least one point in time where like and and i wasn't concerned like you know everyone's gonna go like it wasn't to the point where it's like yeah it's not to like the point where she's like a danger to herself yeah exactly so um and like i definitely saw it pass a little bit but it was surprising to see her even go through that like a little bit so i assume it starts as like a medicine or a lubricant you know what i mean to because you know sometimes it is slow and so much of stripping is hyping yourself up and being your own cheerleader you don't depend on those people's reactions you make them think you're the best shit and that comes from within and that's not like talking shit that's like literally a vibe you have to put off and so if you're not feeling right and something fixes you feeling like that that's how that can happen and it's so strippers um less now than like two decades ago um or like the underbelly of society along with like, you know, drug dealers and all that. And there's still that culture. And then yeah. we won't even get into the drug dealing and like pimp culture and whatever within strip clubs. I really don't want to get into that. Yeah, that's not. We have enough to talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have enough. Like, <laughs> that's like another episode <laughs> itself. So, but yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. like, sorry, continue, continue. No, what were you going to say? I won't. Oh, I mean, just like, yeah, I feel like in the 80s, this is kind of like probably where that whole stereotype um, was born out of for like strippers are all on drugs and we're all like high and all that stuff. And like the drug and the drugs and sex work and like strippers just kind of seem to go hand in hand. I feel like that's 
changed a lot now and a lot of, a lot of people are more in control um the industry has also changed a lot too but um yeah what was the point that you were going to go off on though because i interrupted <laughs> No, I loved where you were going. Like, I oh, totally, yeah. I don't think I had much more to say. I think it, you just extended, like, I I think, like, yeah, no, I think we're just, like, one soul, like, just <laughs> finishing each other's thoughts because, yeah, that was pretty much it. Like, the underbelly of society just meshing together and then, yeah. Um, totally. People I mean, who haven't been through things love to have um, a standard of which they can put themselves above, too. Mm -hmm. so um i think uh that's why the stigma stay is strong too unfortunately yeah it's a little strong to this day so that's really hard i mean w going along with this conversation too and <coughs> sorry we got into this conversation is so last minute it's so like late in the interview but um like how how do you think people cope like it's either do you think it's just um one of two pathways or three pathways in terms of like them staying on uh, substances and going that down that pathway to the point where it can become detrimental to them. Or is there a way that like you, you either quit or is there a way that you can really maintain that without it impacting your work? What's your opinion on that? I feel like every single individual is different. I've been doing a lot more research on harm reduction ever since after my probation because I was in NA and AA and all that. I liked NA a little bit better than AA, but like it almost hurt more um, in the same way that like spirituality can drive you crazy. Like this whole idea, especially because maybe especially because I was in, in Indiana, they weren't reiterating points like, Hey, your work is not erased by relapses. I didn't hear that shit till I was just like on the internet looking at shit posts. And then like through shit posts, I learned about harm reduction. They only teach you about abstinence in yeah. like a lot of places. And that does yes. not work for everyone. And I remember them telling stories in AA like, yeah, once you go back, you're, you're going to fall off hard. I know one guy who had one beer at work. He's off an hour later in a cop car because he just one hour. Really? Come on. Oh, my gosh. Right. That's problematic. It's, like, so extreme, too. It makes you shame yourself, and shame and guilt are the exact feelings that got – Okay, so first we were fixing a feeling because something about us needed to be fixed, right? So there was a shame and a guilt there. And then we start using, and then we kind of shame. And some, some of us get to a point where, like, we're shaming and guilting ourselves for, like, like even needing it, right? And then um, then a absence practices gets people to a point where they feel ashamed if they slip up even. And then I think that will erase progress. Yeah. Um, I – shame and guilt is just going to keep you in that circle, you need room to forgive yourself. I feel like recovery needs to be elastic. I used to be under the delusion whenever I relapsed that I'm under control. I'm fine. And the last relapse I had where I, t I told myself straight up to my brain, I was like, you know, you can't control this. And uh, mm. we'll see where this goes, Tiger. Like, best luck. Like, that was like the easiest I ever dropped it was wow. that. The t when I did not give myself illusion that I'm under control and absence absence gives that illusion. S sorry if it works for you. Yeah. And it can work for some people. I'm trying not to shit talk absence, but this is what it did for me. So, but anyways, the delusions. So I've just come to a place where I'm not under the delusion. I can control myself, but I'm also not under the delusion that I can't, if that makes any sense. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I don't know. Go, no, go on. no, no, I hear you with that. Like, I just feel like there are so many extremes and it's just, it's really hard to be really black and white with this. And sometimes there needs to be that gray area. And as you, as you said, elastic, that's a really good way of putting it too. Like you have to give yourself some wiggle room and you have to give yourself some forgiveness too, because it's like some people can quit cold turkey and yeah. we've had guests on the show that have done that but not everyone is 
going to have it like that and it won't be that simple. You so. can't learn until you forgive yourself. And I feel like journaling is a really good part where that comes in. And yeah, our country's so divided. You're right. There's not a lot of gray area. And I feel like if there's more gray area, there wouldn't be as many kids dying from fentanyl. Like mm. literally, um, the number one deaths now in America are fentanyl. They call it overdoses. I'm going to call it poisoning. Some mm. are choosing to take fentanyl. Yes. Most of these, they did not know it was in there. Yes. Most deaths Correct. in America now are 18 between the ages of 18 and 45 fentanyl deaths it's beat heart disease now crazy so uh i forgot where i was going on about that oh yeah the gray area so if people let a little bit more room for this gray area and like stop saying stuff like oh well these centers these injecting centers you're enabling no we are not someone cannot recover if they're dead someone cannot recover if they're slowly dying from a shared needle that they didn't know had hiv in it and they don't have resources or access to health care you know what i mean we're we're saving people with clean supplies and supervision yeah you know what i mean you can't recover if you're fucking dead (laughs) yeah sorry i'm gonna cry because it's just like um i even now i won't even get into that but like there's Like, you know, neighborhoods where, like, your your kids are at these parties taking these pills. You don't even know it. And you're voting against having these harm reduction facilities in in your own neighborhood. And you don't even know if you're killing your own kid. Yeah. No, unfortunately, this is a huge thing up in Vancouver, Canada, where I live as well. Fentanyl is a huge, huge problem. So many people are dying from that. So I'm really glad that you're able to bring that up, too, because – Unfortunately, because I mean, well, with the nature of this episode too, I mean, although we just kind of really briefly touched on it, um, like sometimes those who are using, like they don't even know what's in or what's being laced with things and the not knowing is a big, big risk, right? So It's a big risk and it's a lot that many addicts are willing to take. Um, Mm -hmm. I can't count. Literally, because I wouldn't even be able to remember how many times I have bought fake pills and I have fentanyl test strips and just said, fuck it, because like I knew I needed the fix regardless and I didn't give a shit. (laughs) Wow, that's that's powerful. So really, really real. And and thank you for sharing that Uh because. We don't. Sorry. No, not at all. Don't I apologize. It, I to mention, I think it comes down to our healthcare system because you know, at the end of the day, people are trying to cope or whatever, and then like these pills are becoming, they get them dependent on it, then they make it less available, and then like yeah, that's what leads into all this. But what were you gonna say? I feel so rude. No, not <laughs> not rude at all. I mean, um, I'm just really happy to acknowledging what you've brought to the table today and with this conversation. And I don't want to end uh, before going to questions and stuff from the fans. Um, I don't want to end on like a sad note, although it is is very real. It is very real though. But um, to wrap up this conversation, like how, how do you balance it all? Like, and how do you balance your own life without, again, going back to the conversation with burnout, um, with any kind of um, chemical or substance use, how do you find balance in it all without going overboard? So balance with my recovery and work is definitely, it's a lot of checking in with yourself. It's a lot of self-awareness. It's a lot of catching yourself. Like, and that can be hard to do sometimes. Like, sometimes, literally, I have to... Okay, Charger, there you are to save my life. Okay. (laughs) It's like, sometimes I'll think that I need a particular thing, right? And then I'm like, you know what? Like, some... Because other addicts can relate to this. Even something as much as, like... Because you have so much shit, other shit going on in your life and everything else is already heavy. It's like to even get up and do the dishes, like you want to do something, right? Doing stuff like, okay, I'll do three before I take anything. And then you're already fucking doing it. And, you know, you ha- you have to find shit that works for you. You have to play mind games with yourself. And not, not – that sounds weird. You have to be so self-aware 
that you can trick yourself, which sounds weird. (laughs) (laughs) Said so. (laughs) Yeah. That's a good way of putting it. I mean, like, and I'm just, like, glad that you're able to share, like, what works for you. Because, like, what works for you is not going to work for everyone else. But, like, um, it's good to hear this because I feel like there are other people that might be out there listening that are like you, too. So thank you for sharing uh, just some insight on how your brain operates and how you're able to cope with things and deal with things. Because it's all about sharing that perspective, especially here on the show and just – and for people that are doing their due diligence of like, you know, um, doing the research and being prepared. And this is what all this like podcast and this particular episode is all about. So thank you, Spencer. But thank you. <laughs> there are a few questions um, that you might have seen on Twitter that have been floating around um, that your fans have asked you. So I feel like it might be time for us to go into that quick section because I know um, – it's your, also your Sunday <laughs> too. So I want to be make sure, making sure that you get out of here on time as well. But let's kind of, yeah, let's go into that. Um, some questions here. So this person writes in, I've always been curious about how they mentally prepare for some scenes when, when they film. Um, like what goes into the day, day-to-day um, to be the best version of yourself for work. Honestly, for me, it's as simple as like reminding, like just because I'm really good at bottling up feelings in my brain and like bringing them back up. So I just like remember what it feels like for my clip to feel really good when I'm using my toy. And I'm like, oh, okay. (laughs) It's simple for me. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) I'm I'm so sorry if that was a disappointing answer, but like literally, I just got to think about like, when I've been turned on before, you know what I mean? Like, not to say that, like, my co-stars don't turn me on. They certainly do. And I certainly actually come a lot. But, like, to get to that spot sometimes because, you know, you're, you're kind of being timed, you know? It's not like you're going your own timing, really. So True. sometimes you really just got to – You got to get into the mindset. Yeah. Yeah. You just got to take yourself back to your bedroom with your vibrator, put your brain there. And that's how I get ready. I love it. <laughs> um, if, if they can go back in time, would, what would they tell Spencer Bradley from 2019 as she was breaking into the industry? Ooh. <laughs> I would have told Spencer that they um, – are worth so much they don't even know like they you literally don't even know how much you're worth like i know you're depressed right now and you want to like rub two dimes together or whatever and this seems like the best like not the best thing that's happened in a while because i was still like eh, whatever like, not eh, whatever but like i'd be like you're just worth so much you're worth so fucking much um I'd ask, why are you doing this? Um, And then maybe I would have asked people some more questions. Maybe I would have actually reached out to performers. Um, I would would tell my old self that, um, oh, God, because honestly, I'd want to lay out the whole thing for myself about, like, building up your social media first, getting in a magazine or something first before even doing a scene. And then like, you know, that shit, you know, I take her through that whole pathway, but like, if I could put shit simple, like if future me, like had a blip it in time to go back, I'd be like, you're worth so much. Don't, don't think you need to accept this and that like, this is all you're worth right now. Go talk to some people um, and talk to multiple people. Don't just talk like, like reach out to people not just to the people approaching you You. because i feel like i would have been on the roster i'm on so much sooner Mm. had i just had a little bit more self-worth and um reached out and talked to some more people instead of only talking to the people that were brought to me right so reach out reach out reach out and you're worth it I love it. I love it. And, you know, a lot of this is a journey too. Like it's like 
<laughs> I think about like my first like entry into sex work as a sugar baby and I'm like, oh man, I would do things a lot <laughs> 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 than I did before. But you know, alas, here we are. We're, we're still okay. <laughs> I feel the same though. Like, like it's almost like, oh man, that sucks. I mean, I'm, I'm glad I have the knowledge and like the actual like hands-on experience, but, yes. but fuck at the same time. Yeah. You know, like, it could have made a lot more money back then. Like what was I thinking? <laughs> okay. Could have, would have, should have. And I didn't have any of the resources, like and knowledge that you do now too. So there you go. That's how it happens. It sounds like you started off sugaring like kind of how I started off porn with like no one around you who's really looking out for you. No one's sharing that much knowledge with you. Like you're, you're just kind of learning as you go. Yeah. And um, for those listening and those who are wanting to get into the work, listen to more podcasts like this. There's tons of resources out and available now. So do your due diligence with that. Um, this question is, what is your favorite deep dish pizza joint in Chicago? Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. So it was normally, I always say it wrong too. It was normally Ginardo's. Ginardo's. Oh, okay. Ginardo's. Yeah, yeah. No, I know that one too. Yes. Lately, <laughs> when I've been going to Chicago, I've been eating Lou's. Yeah, Lou Malnati's. Help yeah, them. I've been I've been doing loose. Yeah, I'm with you on that one too. That's like a thick, <laughs> thick pizza pie, like intense. And if you ever had that, like the next day, like the cheese is like a block of cheese when it's solidified. <laughs> yeah, I love that leftover deep dish. Holy shit! Yeah, no, this fan is a fan because my. <laughs> Fans, no, I love my deep dish pizza. Like, I'm hoping, I'm hoping I can find one to be delivered after this. Because literally, after I get off this, um, I am gonna eat and I'm gonna have a fuck it moment to myself before I get on OnlyFans. <laughs> and you deserve it. <laughs> and we'll get you out of here soon. Just two more, yeah, pretty much two more questions here. So. Um, also, does Spencer miss being an exotic dancer? Will they be featuring again? Is it different dancing after becoming a porn star? What is it like preparing for shows now than, um, than before? Um, ooh, that's a lot of questions. A lot of well, questions. <laughs> it's like four questions in that one. <laughs> what was the first one again? The first one is, um, does Spencer miss being an exotic dancer? I do miss being an exotic dancer. Um, see, I thought stripping was isolating. Porn is so much more isolating. Yeah, because at least, like, of course it switches up every two, three years because that's just the rotating door of the industry. But you got your backbone of, like, regular girls in the dressing room. Yes. You know what I mean? You got the like, camaraderie. Yeah, and you don't really get a sense of camaraderie if ever in porn until you're a few years in and like, you know, you've seen a bunch of the crew that's been in for decades and they know you. And then like, and it's like, Oh, I get to see you today, you know, cause you working with different people all the time, but like it takes a much longer time to build a sense of camaraderie with your coworkers when there is that, rotating door and also that rotating do door factoring in with there's a rotation of shoots and crews and talents itself right never thought about that way but so i'm a little isolated i miss my stripper girls feature dancing is a lot different um uh i hate admitting this because whatever it is what it is i'm working on it I'll put it like this. I'm working on being more confident as a feature dancer because when I was you. just stripping, thank you. It was like, oh, I felt like I did a better job just stripping because it's like, you know, because I knew I had to exude confidence and whatever. And then with feature dancing, my face is big up there. <laughs> my name is scrolling across a marquee. I'm like, it's a lot of pressure. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, it's just me, guys. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see you, too. 
But yeah, it, it adds an extra thing of pressure that I think also not being in the club all the time, you create a flow for yourself, right? Mm-hmm. And I've been yeah. doing porn. And I didn't realize how weak some of those muscles has gotten. And <laughs> I don't know. So I, I'm taking a break from fe- featuring right now until I get my body back right and like really good shape. My Pittsburgh one went really well because that was a two night nice. one. Nice. So, okay, yeah. Some muscle memory came back for that one. But there's <laughs> there's more feature dance. Well, obviously, with the likelihood, five years stripping, and I've only done, like, five feature dance gigs. Of course, there's going to be a higher likelihood of feature dancing. Mm-hmm. But I, I've been more embarrassed to feature dancing than regular stripping, 100%. Because, mm-hmm. like, just too much in my head or, like, uh, and when I do get out of my head, like, I'm like, okay, cool. You're doing it. You're doing it. And then it's like, I don't know. All, all the little things trip me up. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I don't know. It'll just, it's a lot different being a name. Yeah. Just to attract people. But, and I'm working on <clears throat> being confident and being like, yeah, yeah, you are that bitch. Like you Get don't, it. don't be shy. Sh- show them who Spencer was on stage. Show them who show them who stripper Spencer was. Yeah. Give them a porn star Spencer. Go show them stripper Spencer. Here we go. I love that. Again, a journey. All of the journey, right? Um, I guess the last kind of question, although it kind of goes well uh, with that first kind of question to, or the second question, but what advice would Spencer give herself if she could go back in time when she was first starting career in sex work? Uh, yeah, I just talk to more people and I do a little bit more research. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would have just navigated things differently. Mm-hmm. I would have navigated things a lot differently as far as um, – what my first scene would have been, how I would have handled my social media. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause there was one point I was number 71 on Pornhub. Wow. And now the past like two years I've been in the st- it's steady. I- I'm 700 something baby. <laughs> two years now. But the Great thing time. is that was when I very first started. And that's when one of my very first clips came out. And I did not have the people around me that wanted me to know anything, how to leverage myself. That that right there, my debut on Pornhub and being in the top 100, that was go time for me yeah. to work and do some shit and do some content and be doing podcasts and be that that was the time to go fucking work, work, yeah. work. And nobody did that for me. And I didn't have the knowledge to go do that myself. I could have been so much more, so much quicker, but I don't mind putting in the fucking work, you know, like, <laughs> I'm going to be alive <laughs> against my will. Either way, I'm going to take up my time, put pulling up my porn hub ranking. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I guess what you're saying is like, no, that was a really critical time. And like, it, it was, it would have been really important to kind of ramp that up a bit more. So yeah. yeah, it would have been important to if, – if my – because it's the agent I had at that time, that Florida agent, he regularly had talks with me, pulled me aside and told me, you're too dominant to ever be a star. Like, and I won't no. say more than that because there is more tea, but um, I didn't name any names. And um, if you say anything, you're giving yourself up, so <laughs> – I love it. I love the shade. <laughs> How about those fuckers? Whatever. Like, you know, I, I hate hearing stuff about that. Like when agencies are, are like that or like whispering these like problematic things in talent's ears. And it's just like, you know, some people, they really take this stuff seriously. So fuck For real. Them. Yeah. Seriously. And the most hilarious part is on Twitter, like after I wasn't with Spiegler yet, I was with Next Level, but you know, I was still in the game. I hadn't, didn't scare me off yet. I hadn't been scared off yet. Uh, he was commenting on stuff like, oh, I always knew Spencer was going to do really good. You literally pulled me aside for talks about the exact opposite. That's the, so fucked. The, the exact opposite. But now... You prob- when you're recruiting girls now, just like you guys use Christy Merck's name with me and Alina Lopez, 
name with me, just like how you used all these big names that hate you now, these big Ooh. names that hate you, and you use their names to girls who know fucking no better at all, saying like, oh yeah, I discovered them, I can do this for you, I bet he's doing that to girls who, like, not, not saying I'm big, big like that, like those names at all, I am not. But, like, there are, like, more, like, girls on Twitter, like, being curious with porn and all that. So, what they might be out, like, from the decent following and, like, you know, just how everything works. So, girls interested in his stuff or people he might be recruiting, he might be sending them, like, my, like oh, well, we discovered her. Look how well she's doing. Mm. If anything, you hindered me and I had to fucking... I had to fight tooth and nail to crawl myself up to where I am because you gave me a shit beginning, dude. So yeah. it's funny watching him say, oh, I always knew you're going to be a big star on Twitter because I knew then in my head, I was like, yeah, he's telling girls like. Oh, like, for sure. And just taking advantage. And like, I, I fucking hate that. And like, if you all listen to last week's episode uh, with Lily Craven, her some of her advice is like, oh, if they are dropping names, make sure you're actually reaching out to those people and asking them their real opinions on that shit to be like, hey, how was it working with this person um, to get the real fucking tea? Because usually people just drop in names here and there and it's just like that's actually not the reality of, of things. So I I thank you I for calling it out. It. Yeah. Well, you know, like when your career is – starting out like you don't want to it's like walking eggshells like you, you don't want to fuck things up and you just want to like yeah survive right so you almost want to be agreeable with everyone but that's not like yeah the best thing in porn always unfortunately there is one girl who they reached out to that did reach out to me they're like hey the, the, these people reach out to me i wanted your opinion and i was being very political i did not say anything bad all i said is I'm happy they were able to get my foot in the door. Um, and that's all I really want to say. Um, I think you should definitely do some more reaching out and talk to some more people about, like, if you're interested in porn, just keep reaching out to people. Mm -hmm. um, all I'm going to say about this particular person you're asking me about, I'm just happy they got my foot in the door. And yeah. That's all I'm going to say. And that statement – all like, even though you know you're just you're being political and like polite, it's also saying a lot. Like people should be able to read between the lines with something like that. So there you go. I would hope. Yeah, I would hope so too, right? But I mean, this is so spicy. I love the ending of this episode. <laughs> so yeah, cool. right. You're so cool. I want to hang out with you. I wish you weren't in Vancouver. I, I want to like when I'm in down in I... LA, I'll come. I'm come, I'll come reach out for sure. <laughs> You come to LA? Yeah, sometimes I do. Like I was just there last, actually last Christmas, um, and for concerts and stuff. I like to come down when and if possible. Weather is better down there, so feel you, feel you. Definitely, let me know when you come to LA because I think you'd be cool vibes. I feel like we could talk and talk and talk and talk. And I'm so sorry that I talked over you at a few points. No, no, not at all. Don't even worry about it. But hang on, Spencer, before I let you go, where can we find you? <laughs> where can everyone find you? Everyone will always be able to find me on spencerbradley.com. That is my domain name. So, yeah, Elon Musk can't kick me off that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you'll find all my big sites on spencerbradley.com. You know, that's where you'll find my OnlyFans. Um, if you like podcasts and you're listening to this podcast, you should definitely check out my Voil. There is <clears throat> there is a link to my Voil um, on spencerbradley.com. I believe it's the last link. Those are my own audio clips. Cool. Healthy. And I don't just do like the... Mm, uh, <clears throat> I'm touching myself. Like that's cool. That's sexy. I do that too, but I do like meditation masturbation with you cool. i also do series of meeting people in a club i tell you true stories like my own true stories there's some there's some stripper stories on there too on the boil on my yeah I, I got some stripper stories on there for people to listen to so if you want to go to spencerbradley.com and check out my voice clips on boil that's cool on twitter you'll find me on spencer bradley x on instagram you'll find me at spencer bradley official 
on TikTok, you'll find me at official Spencer Bradley. And on Reddit, you'll find me at Spencer hyphen Bradley. Woo! That's a lot of shit. And <laughs> all of the links will be in the show notes below. So, I mean, if you're listening this far and haven't clicked on all the things, what are you even doing? Be sure to say hello to Spencer. If you like this episode, reach out to her. She's super, super nice. And for everyone else listening at home, it's new episodes every single Sunday, dropping at midnight, Civic Standard Time. That's West Coast time. And yeah, we'll uh, catch everyone in for another episode next week. Catch me on all podcast streaming platforms there is out there rate five stars on spotify rate five stars on apple maybe write a review i read them all um but that's pretty much it for today spencer thank you so much for today it was a pleasure <laughs>